Luke chapter 7. So, you know, you've got Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and then you have the same teaching in Luke's account. It's after this. We come to chapter 7, verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And now a centurion had a servant who was sick at the point of death who was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus... He sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal a servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He's worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house, a centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word. And let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So I titled this one, What Made Jesus Glad? Last week we talked about what made him mad. Because we're taking cues from Jesus. By the way, good to see you here. we got visitors. Some I haven't seen in a long time. Wonderful to see your faces. Um, hope this is an encouragement to you. We're taking our cues from Jesus Because he's the one that shapes our life. We're being molded into his image. And what we discussed last week is that sometimes in our lives, there are things we're getting all riled up about that we shouldn't be riled up about. And then there are things in our lives that we should have more concern about, like honoring God and praise and worship to him. The the danger of hypocrisy. The danger of taking traditions and making them meatier than God's actual word. Uh, The problem of sin and death. And so this week we're talking about, well, what made Jesus glad? Well, here's, let me just go and get this out of the way. Faith, faith. You know, and at the end of John chapter two, it talks about how Jesus did these signs. And the result of that is that people believed in him. But John goes out of his way to make this point. Jesus did not return the favor. Jesus did not entrust himself to men. He didn't need anyone to bear witness about men because he knew what was in men. Whenever I think about the word faith, I think the word trust immediately. And I mean that in the most reverent and deepest sense possible. I mean, not like, yeah, I trust you'll do that. No, I mean, when I talk about trust in God, I'm saying it is a done deal, an absolute trust in God. I asked Jordan this week, kind of, this is the, well, we, I said, hey, <laughs> I said, I got a Bible test for you. I said, you're going to like this. She goes, I don't think any test I like. She's like, hit me with it. I said, tell me about the two examples where Jesus really goes out of his way to almost kind of compliment someone's faith. There, there are many instances where I believe that Jesus is definitely taking note, but this one stands out. This is one of the two. Um, we've got a centurion. Let me just paint the scene here, okay? So, so we've got a, a, a centurion, depending on the material you're looking at, he's a military leader, over 80 to 100 men. Okay. He's in Capernaum. So Jesus is from Nazareth. But now we're going to the east, to the Sea of Galilee, around its borders. And we find out that he makes that his home base. Okay? So Jesus is functioning a lot of out of Capernaum, that area, where he's doing this early ministry. You've got the centurion who comes to Jesus. And actually, from, from Matthew's account, it looks like he himself talks with Jesus. But that's not the case. 
Matthew's account is a shortened version. And we see in re- reality what happened is that he sends Jews to Jesus to ask him to come, or to say the word and to heal his servant. He's a centurion. He's a Gentile. Very interesting. Because you remember whenever, whenever Peter went into the home of Cornelius, how awkward that was for him? And do you remember that before he begins to preach Jesus, how Peter says, you know it's not lawful for us to be associating with one another, for me to be in a home of a foreigner. It's actually surprising because these centurions, again, Roman military leaders, and in the New Testament, coincidentally, they're almost always shed in a good light. So whenever Jesus is on the cross, it's a centurion that sees how Jesus dies and the earthquake and how Jesus gives up his spirit. And it's a centurion that says, truly, this was the son of God. This man was innocent. Speaking of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, what was he? Cornelius was a centurion. Later on, uh, when you're going to read about Paul's about to be whipped, and it's a centurion that's, that's asked by Paul, hey, is it your practice to whip Roman citizens? And actually he acts pretty fair and balanced and refrains from doing so. He's a Gentile. Brother, Jesus ends up marveling at his faith. I normally don't do this, but I wanted to look at this term to understand, like, what was its precise meaning? Like, I know what I think of whenever I hear marvel. It means to be extraordinarily impressed or disturbed by something or an act. So in other words, the context will tell. And we know in this context, Jesus is extraordinarily impressed. But I love my fancy Bible software. It does even better. It breaks all these things down, every passage in the correct sense in which they understand it's being used. And so the broad idea is that you're extraordinarily impressed, but specifically it means to admire, to wonder at, to respect someone. Jesus has this encounter with him, and he's essentially telling him, yeah, I respect what I'm seeing here. I assume that Jesus appreciated this man. His words to Jesus are this. I'm also under authority and over authority. Jesus knew something about that. I assume that he respected the fact that he had a servant that he valued. I'm coming to you, not really on my behalf, but on someone else's behalf. But even that doesn't really do it. See, actually, how did he come to him? As I harmonize both Matthew and Luke's account, here's what I think happened. I don't think that the centurion asked for the Jewish leaders to request him literally come to his house but just to ask that he heal the man. Because he sends the Jewish leaders to him, he sees Jesus not far away, he sends his friends and says, stop. He said, I didn't presume to come to you. There's a certain element that I wonder if he was trying to save Jesus from that stigma, again, of a Jew having to go into a Gentile's house. But what I do know for sure is this, He told Jesus, I'm not worthy of you. I'm not worthy to have you in my house. Lord, essentially what is he telling him? I get it. And I can say to someone, go, and they go. And I can ask someone, come, and they come. And I can tell someone, go do it. And they're going to do it. And so what I'm telling you, and he's saying this through his friends, just say the word. Jesus marvels at him. You know, the only other time in Scripture that we find out that Jesus marvels is in Mark 6, 6. 
and it's speaking about Nazareth, his own town, his own people didn't believe in him. And it says that he marveled at their unbelief. I respect the centurion because as I was chewing on this this week, I realized how much I like to control things. Matter of fact, Mandy and I were just talking about I stayed, I could not sleep last night. I was up until 2 a.m. playing Gardenscapes. I've talked about Gardenscapes. You guys know I got a problem with it. We were like, why don't we like these silly little games? She says, yeah, I think you get to control everything. I was like, eh. <laughs> I think that's right. Here's a guy that, that has control, yet he realizes I'm not really in control of this situation at all. Do you know how much time and effort we pour into trying to control things that are absolutely out of our control? Do you realize the humility that it took for this man who has dozens of men under him saying, please go to him, just let that guy give the word and it will be done? Hey, brethren, here's a question. When's the last time you think you made God marvel at your faith? I don't, I don't want to be silly about this, be disrespectful just to make a good preaching point. I'm very aware that I don't think that that centurion was in a position every day necessarily just to make God marvel. Okay, so I, I want to be clear about this. But Jesus marveled. And, and by the way, not to get sidetracked on another topic, have you ever thought about the implications that Jesus marveled? It's almost insinuating that like Jesus didn't know how this was going to go. Anyone married? You ever get in a rut? When's the last time your spouse has marveled at you? I'm seeing some funny faces. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Brethren, I'll make this point and I'll keep going. I'm, I'm afraid that I get too relaxed with Jesus and who he is. I'm, I'm afraid that, that he can look at my life and be like, yeah, that's Sean, yeah, I know what to expect. <laughs> there, there's nothing wrong with faithful endurance. We talk about life as a marathon. But brethren, not at the expense that we start going through the motions. And quite frankly, we're not catching his attention anymore. You know, there, there's a passage in Luke chapter 17 I begin in verse 5, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him who has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he think the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Be honest. Have you ever read that passage and you don't like how it makes you feel? I don't think that that centurion had a problem with it. What that centurion gained was a closer relationship and tie to Jesus Christ. I say this, and then truly I'll move on. You have so much time on this earth to build a relationship with Christ. This is not about trying to outdo your neighbor. It is about the blessing of actually coming to know who Jesus is with the time given you, that you may benefit from having such a Lord and Savior. And while this passage does not define every aspect of our relationship, it cannot be ignored. 
Which brings me to our next and final example. This is Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. This coincidentally is off the heels of Jesus' warning against preferring our traditions or their traditions over the commandments of God. Verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered her, It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat at the crumbs, eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Really quickly, it's interesting because Mark defines her our, our, and identifies her as the Canaanite woman. Not the Syrophoenician woman in Mark's account, which was more current. Canaanite was like an old school term. And I think he does that because it conjures the hostility between God's people and their their enemy. This woman had a few things against her. Number one, she was a she, not a he. In that time and culture. And she was a Gentile. And on top of that, I want you to think about it from a cultural perspective, especially if you have an enemy and you like to find things that are wrong with them. Her daughter is demon-possessed. Why is her daughter demon-possessed? You know, I wonder about these kinds of things because it was not rare for a Jew to believe that you're hurting physically because what? Sin. I mean, in, in John 9, where they have the man that's born blind, they asked the Lord, literally, who sinned, his parents or him? Why is he like this? Dusty taught us the book of Job, and his friend's conclusion was, clearly you have, you've sinned, you have transgressed. She's got all these things going against her, but she's got one who's four, and that's all that mattered. Because what Jesus saw was this woman who was absolutely tenacious coming for him. But here's the thing. I want us to appreciate the awkwardness of this passage. At least for me, like I was saying, Luke 17, that whole thing about at the end of the day, you just say, well, you've done what you're supposed to do. (laughs) Well, Lord, shouldn't I get a thank you? No. (laughs) Your job was to serve me. You served me. Right. Right. Because, see, Jesus ends up calling her a what in this passage? He calls her a dog. Let me tell you, the commentators go crazy with this one because everyone's trying to explain Jesus to everybody. I don't know what to do with this. Literally, it gets to the, to, to the point where commentators are saying, well, here, understand this, though. So, to, to the Gentiles... A dog was your, was your pet. You'd, you'd have it in your house. But remember, the Jews, they were unclean. So this is actually a kind thing. It, there, was, there was a close... He called her a dog, guys. Dog, just in general, wasn't a kind term. Actually, in the, in the New Testament, if you want to be technical, when you read dog, it's not referencing Gentiles. It's referencing God's people. Let, let me tell you how awkward this situation is. Let's walk with this woman for a moment. Jesus, in um, Mark's account, actually enters a house and was hoping to hide there. <laughs> but he was, he was well known and he couldn't hide. She finds him out. She goes to him. She cries out, Lord, son of who? Son of David. So she knew something about him. See, if you asked a Jew back then, and the scriptures confirm this, what's the relationship between Christ and David? A Jew would say, well, he's the son. He, he, the son right? Whenever this woman says, son of David, she is confirming, this, who I, this is who I believe you to be. You are the son of David. I'm asking you for help. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. 
You know what, how Jesus returns that? He gives her the silent treatment. So before we try to explain away the statement of her, him calling her a dog, we try to make this all real, like overly lighthearted. This is not a lighthearted moment. This woman is desperate. She goes to him, acknowledges him, and he ignores her. The disciples say, send her away, for she's crying out after us. And I think what's implied here is that they're asking him to help her. Because his answer to them is, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. I don't think he was just confirmed, yeah, that's right, I'm not going to help her because I'm only here for you. I think what's saying, like, would you just help her and get her out of here? And Jesus' answer is, uh uh-uh. I'm assuming the woman hears this. She doesn't give up. She goes to Jesus, drops to her knees, and she tries to reason with him and says, Lord, help me. And he says, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. Children being Israel here. Now, I will tell you, brethren, I do believe that there's probably something in the tone and the way he said that. I still do believe that. In other words, I would not be shocked. Matter of fact, I kind of expect that it was the time. You know, I could look at Jordan and smile and go, oh, I really hate you. (laughs) You know, there is something about the way you say a thing. And I do kind of perceive in this that she was picking up on it. Her response is, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And the reason why I want to stress the awkwardness is because I don't also want to downplay. Jesus, I believe, was testing her faith, and Jesus was teaching the disciples a lesson. I want you to pay attention. This woman had the humility to tell him, Lord, I know that. I don't actually disagree with anything that you said. And I'm not asking for a bread, I'm asking for a crumb. And now he responds, oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. You know what? Have it be your way. You can have what you want. You know I like to always go back to Jesus as much as we can because this is who we committed our lives to. This is the man. See him in all his glory. See him in his his love. This Gentile woman, she was no scholar. Brother... Quick observations in this sermon as you, as yours. <laughs> I, I can't speak today. I don't know what's wrong with me. My mind is just going all over the place. You're a very patient audience today. Maybe it's because I was up until 2 a.m. playing Gardenscapes. That's my fault. I'm reminded yet again of these experiences that Jesus has with these Gentiles. And I realize I already said this earlier, so now I guess I won't belabor the point. How many times have I seen other people from the outside come in, and I wonder what happened to my zeal? What happened to my passion? Have I become spiritually spoiled? Am I I entitled? Do I think this thing has deserved me? Have I left my first love? Some of you, literally, I had the pleasure of seeing you at the early stages come to the Lord. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll, I'll brag, Kyle Caston, he's one of, he's, I, and I mean that, I've, I got to see Kyle at the early stages come to the Lord. And he set our faith on fire. You know, the other thing that I realize is that Jesus just doesn't lose sight of the big picture. I'm, I'm going to keep bragging on the casting for a little bit, make you awkward here.
Beckett's a sharp little kid. Um, sometimes I'll throw out, you know, a, a Bible verse, and I, I won't say the last word, and you'll hear Beckett finish it. Now, I believe that his parents study with him, so I want to be very clear. For all I know, though, Beckett could just be a whiz of a kid. That kid could just be great at hearing things and spitting it, spitting it out. I don't know. But let me tell you something that, that, that comes from Beckett. I'm talking to Peg, Peggy the other day. And she brings him up and she says, uh, he came up to me and he asked me how we were doing, me and Tom. And I said, not too well. And she's watching these last stages of her husband. And Beckett says, I'm sorry, I've been praying for Tom every night. That's why Jesus got mad whenever they hindered the children from coming to him. Do, you, do, you, do we get the point? It made Jesus furious. The text says it made him indignant to not keep those children from coming to me. See, whenever I look at, whenever I look at the big picture of what was happening, Jesus had the most issue with the scholars What Jesus was saying, by the way, the week he was betrayed, he was about to be crucified, he gathers his disciples around and he says, I want you to look at this widow over here. She put in maybe like a couple of pennies into the treasure, but she gave everything she had. Would you please pay attention to this? Jesus had to ask these self-righteous leaders in this house, do you see this woman? Because I feel like I'm the only one that's seen this woman. From the time I came in, you didn't greet me. You didn't love on me. You didn't wash my feet. She's been wetting my feet with her tears because she loved much. Am I the only one that's seeing this? Do you see this woman? Jesus is the one that's saying, how is it that I just healed ten lepers? And the only one that came back to thank me was that Gentile. Jesus is the one, he sees a group of men who have a friend, see he's a paralytic, and he can't get around town. But Jesus comes to town, and they got to get him to Jesus. But they can't get him to Jesus, because it's packed. And so they go, well, let's get on the roof and tear the roof off. I, I still like to think that Jesus is just smiling as he watches, they interrupt his teaching, and hay's falling down at everybody. And they're lowering this guy down. The text says, Jesus saw what? Jesus saw their faith. This is what I'm gleaning from the Bible. And the end of it all was this, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. I forgive you. I forgive you. So, brethren, my closing remarks are this. It was, it was a good week for me to be reading this. But I'm, I'm, I'm going, can, can I cause the Lord to marvel? And you know what I mean by that. You know what I mean, you know what I mean by that. Am I even worth looking at anymore? This has to have some practical application in my life. The easiest thing to do, I, I'm so thrilled to be with you this morning. I genuinely mean that. I, I, and I need this. I need this. God knew that in my weakness, I needed you. I needed to gather with you. And he reminded that I'm part, not just with him, but with you. But I got to tell you, this is the easiest part of my week. My faith really is tested tomorrow morning when I wake up. We have got to change. 
We've got to sacrifice. We've got to mold in our marriages, in our parenting, in our friendships, at work. So will we, will we give him something to look at this week? I pray that we do. Will we stop trying to control everything and put our faith in Jesus? Are we, are we happy just to have the crumbs that fall from this table? And I think you would agree he gave us more than crumbs. <laughs> Praise God. So thank you for your attention. God bless you as you live for him this week. And can I say it this way in the most respectful way? Make him proud. Let's stand and sing praises to our Father together.